Act One of Dr. Johnson, a play by Mr. A. Edward Newton. To Cecil Harmsworth, Esquire, M.P. My dear Harmsworth, in dedicating this book to you, I do not doubt that I chiefly honor myself. You will, nevertheless, accept it as gesture of appreciation from the plantations, as Dr. Johnson called this country. You have made 17 Gulf Square, the house in which the dictionary was written, a shrine to which Johnsonians resort to do honor to his memory. And, sir, in Johnsonian phrase, you are to regard this slight performance, if it be pleasing to you, as a reward of merit, and if otherwise, as one of the inconveniences of eminence. A. Edward Newton Argument Any one with a teaspoonful of imagination can read this play with pleasure. With two teaspoons full, I will not be responsible for results. He, or she, may be disappointed, for there is no plot to speak of. But there is talk, about as good talk as has ever been reported, and James Boswell as a reporter has never had an equal. My own part in the work is very attenuated, as attenuated as a piece of thread. It has to be, for on this slender thread of my own manufacture I have elected to string jewels, exquisite in cut and color. It is believed that the stones match and that the thread does not show much. The jewels are, most of them, genuine. A few are Teclas, and ardent Johnsonians and Boswellians, too, may amuse themselves in sorting them out if they care to. I permit myself to remark that several experts have been deceived. For several, I am indebted to friends. For example, the letter on page 108 was written many years ago, not by Dr. Johnson, but by an eminent Johnsonian scholar, to Mrs. Newton, who greatly values it. Likewise the retort, Madam, I take refuge in incredulity, I got from Mrs. John Marco, who had it from her father. The phrase is faultlessly Johnsonian. If it was originally Johnson's, I cannot put my mental finger upon it. The reference to the dictionary being edited by a Scotch Presbyterian is an imitation of Johnson, which was doing double duty in the newspapers a few years ago. I do not know who set this ball rolling. Amy Lowell, Carolyn Sinclair, and Mrs. John Marco were invited to Mrs. Thrale's party, but were unable to accept. I don't care a fig for the defection of the females, Mrs. Thrale remarked to her husband one morning over the breakfast table, tossing aside several notes. Elizabeth Carter and Hannah Moore and Mrs. Montague will be only too glad to take their places, but mark my words, it means that we shall lose the Lord Primate, Edmund Burke and Charles Fox, and I had rather counted on their adding luster to the affair. Don't count your chickens before they are hatched, my dear, said Mr. Thrale. And, he continued, they will lose an excellent dinner. A word as to my cast. The greatest actor that England ever produced, as well as some of her greatest men, authors, artists, dramatists, and statesmen, grand ladies and women of the town, are included. It would be difficult to get such a company together nowadays. You may say that my actors are merely shadows. I stipulated that you were to have a teaspoonful of imagination. You remember that. For myself, at any rate, these people, all of them, are my very real friends. They are quite as real and much more entertaining than most of those amongst whom my lot is cast. Had I been in London in the middle of the eighteenth century, should I have been privileged to know them as I know them now? I should say, or rather they would have said, certainly not. I am better off as I am, and perhaps you are too, dear reader. Exit author, carrying a short piece of thread which he had left over. A. Edward Newton. Oak Knoll, Lowellsford, Pennsylvania, June 23, 1922. Topographical. Act One. Dr. Johnson's house in Gough Square still exists. In his time it was not an unfashionable neighborhood, it is believed to be the only one of Dr. Johnson's many London residences now remaining, and of all of them it is the most important, for in it Johnson lived for ten years, from 1748 to 1758, and in it he wrote the greater part of the dictionary and several other of his more important literary works. 
The house was acquired by Mr. Cecil Harmsworth, M.P., in 1911, and it remains his property, although it is understood that he may give it to the nation. After thoughtful and expensive alterations, which mercifully are but little in evidence, it has become one of the most visited of the small museums in London. It is not exactly easy to find. After leaving the Griffin, the site of Old Temple Bar, walking some distance east on the left-hand side of Fleet Street and peering up or down a number of narrow courts with such seductive names as Johnson's Court, which, by the way, has no reference whatever to R. Johnson, and Bolt Court, one comes upon Wine Office Court. Turning up or down, one passes on the right, after a few steps, the old Cheshire cheese. The legend which associates this tavern with the great lexicographer is a triumph of advertising, for there is no single contemporary reference connecting Johnson with it. It is, however, quite possible that he may have frequented it, as it was on his side of Fleet Street, which, as an old man, he disliked to cross. Passing the cheese, a distance of perhaps fifty yards, and turning sharply to the left, a short walk brings one into Gough Square, with the Johnson house on the opposite side. And it is well worth a visit. It is now ninety years since Carlyle, not without labor and risk, discovered it, and wrote a description of it in his famous review of a new edition of Boswell's Life of Johnson. It is a substantial brick edifice of three stories and an attic. The front doorway deserves special attention, and the quaint chain bolt inside should not be overlooked. The stout, old-fashioned oak balustraded stairs, which caught Carlyle's eye, still remain as evidence of the good workmanship of two hundred and odd years ago. The caretakers, who live in a tiny house nearby, are excellent Johnsonians, and take pleasure in showing the house to the constantly increasing number of disciples of the dear old doctor, in whom we know not what most to admire, his wisdom, his wit, or his character. Acts 2 and 3 Thrale Place, Mr. Henry Thrale's county residence at Stratton, was a large substantial mansion situated in an open and salubrious suburb about six miles out of London. The house itself has long since disappeared, and the once fine estate is now entirely built over, but the family name is preserved in the tiny almshouses established by Henry Thrale in the High Street, and in Thrale Street, which runs through what was once the paddock. Act Four Bolt Court is situated not many yards east of Gulf Square. The house in which Dr. Johnson died was taken down many years ago to make room for a modern printing house. A tablet led into the wall marks its location. Characters in Act One Mr. Stewart, read by James Thomas Mr. Maitland, read by Thomas Peter Mr. Macbean, read by Alan Mapstone Mr. Levitt, read by Mike Casey Dr. Johnson, read by Jim Locke a Voice, Macpherson's, read by Lynette Calkins. Mr. Boswell, read by Campbell Shelp. A Servant, Lord Chesterfield's, read by Aaron White. Mrs. Williams, read by Elsie Selwyn. Frank, Dr. Johnson's Colored Servant, read by Nemo. Mr. Allen, read by Adrian Stevens. Mrs. Woffington, read by Sandra Schmidt. Bet Flint, read by Lian Yao. Paul Carmichael, read by Eva Davis. Mrs. Thrill, read by Thorn. Narration, read by Todd. We are in London in February 1755, in a house in Gough Square off Fleet Street. The attic in which we find ourselves, in which we can see and hear without being ourselves observed, is large, with the ceiling sloping on one side. The sun shining obscurely through three windows suggests early dawn, but it is almost noon. Before each window is a small deal table. Seated at these tables are three men, shabbily dressed. One is reading, the other two are writing. On the right, a door opens into a passage. On the left, a door opens into a bedroom. In a tiny grate in the corner, a small fire burns unwillingly. A screen in another corner partly conceals a couch on which is a man, seemingly asleep. A very large deal table is in the center of the room, in front of which is a great armchair, vacant. 
Plain shelves, loaded down with books, are on either side of each door. Folio volumes are in piles upon the floor. Extreme poverty is suggested in every detail. Papers are strewn about in great disorder. There is complete silence. Finally, one man, having finished his writing, sands it, sticks his quill behind his ear, gets up, stretches himself, and remarks, Oh, Dr. Johnson is late this morning. Mr. Maitland, putting down his book, Dr. Johnson is always late. Dr. Johnson is later than usual. Dr. Johnson is always later than usual. Mr. McBean, looking up from his writing, I suppose he feels he can permit himself a little relaxation now that our dictionary is completed. Our dictionary? You grammatical outcast, you had very little to do with it. Dr. Johnson only took you on from pity. After a pause, I feel I have never done anything but copy, copy, copy. Words, words, words. I am not fit for anything else. I will remember the time when Dr. Johnson thought you were not fit for that. What do you mean? That time when you copied letter S complete and entire on both sides of the paper, and it had all to be done over again. I remember. At a cost of twenty poons. I expected to see Dr. Johnson lose his temper. Instead of which he only remarked, Mistakes will happen. That which can be remedied at the expenditure of a few guineas cannot be regarded as serious. We must set doggedly to work and do it over again. I am told that the money he was to receive from the booksellers has all been spent. Every penny of it. And what we are to do now I can't imagine. Already I'm beginning to feel the pangs of hunger. I'll go and look for food. Mr. Levitt, an awkward and uncouth old man, rising from the couch. Did I hear the word food? You did. And hearing about it is as near as you're likely to come to breakfasting this morning. We ate every crumb in the house hours ago. Ah, well, I supped late last night and can fast till dinner. A grateful patient would insist upon my keeping him company till late, and as my day's work was done, I obliged him. And in that way you made sure of your fee, I suppose? I practice my profession for the love of it rather than for sixpences. It makes little difference to me whether I am paid in money or in food. Dr. Johnson gives me shelter here, and I need little else. And Mrs. Levitt? What of her? What of her? Sir, mine was not the first unfortunate alliance. Mrs. Levitt still makes her living in the streets, as she was accustomed to do before I married her. At present she is in a jail. I hear that she is soon to be tried at the Old Bailey for picking pockets. She may be transported unless I can persuade Dr. Johnson to speak for her character. Which I have no doubt you can. To be in misery and distress is to be certain of Dr. Johnson's compassion. Did he not testify as to the character of Mr. Thrale's tutor? What was that Italian's name? Baretti. And he committed murder. He stabbed a man in the street. But under great provocation? In self-defense? A street door closes with a bang, and voices are heard outside. Retract, sir. What would you have me retract? I thought your book an imposture. I think it is an imposture still. Your rage I defy. I hope I shall never be deterred from detecting what I think a cheat by the menaces of a rough. A voice, Macpherson's, outside. No man shall call me cheat and go unpunished. Any violence offered me I shall do my best to repel, and what I cannot do for myself the law shall do for me. Go, sir, and tell your friends of our quarrel. Dr. Johnson, a large, burly man, shabbily dressed, throws open the door and enters, followed by James Boswell, a young man with a tip-tilted nose, stylishly dressed. I am astonished. Sir, you may be astonished, but your astonishment will be as nothing compared to the amazement of that scoundrel, should he venture to attack me. I know how to take care of myself. 
sam foot once announced that he would take me off as the saying goes on the stage i had this story from tom davies the bookseller what is the price of an oak stick said i sixpence said tom give me leave sir said i to send your servant to buy me a shilling's worth i'll have double quantity and be ready for mr foot's mimicry and i give you leave to tell him so mr foot took his talents to another market good morning levitt good morning gentlemen our task is almost at an end have our last sheets gone to the printer yes sir a messenger carried the last sheet away an hour since what did he say did he leave any message yes sir he said thank god i have done with him dr johnson smiling benignly i am glad he thanks god for anything gentlemen shall we make it a holiday you are excused until next monday at the cheshire cheese near by in fleet street there is beefsteak and kidney pie and a mug of mr thrale's ale giving mr mcbee a coin spend this among you thank you sir and i thank you sir good morning sir mr maitland bowing you are very good sir the three leave the room you must be relieved that the work is finished you did not fully realize what you were undertaking when you set out sir i knew very well what i was undertaking and very well how to go about it and have done it very well but i sadly underestimated the time it has taken me eight years but sir the french academy which consists of forty members took forty years to compile their dictionary dr johnson smiling then sir this is the proportion let me see forty times forty is sixteen hundred as eight is to sixteen hundred so is the proportion of an englishman to a frenchman i hope sir it has made you rich sir i did not work for money but for the honour of my country that we might no longer yield the palm of philology to the nations of the continent without a contest i am sir in point of fact as poor as i have ever been i would not say poorer for that would be impossible indeed only a few days ago i was arrested for debt is it possible it is not unusual for an author to be arrested for debt but the matter occasioned me little distress mr richardson became my surety and the matter was speedily adjusted but the booksellers surely sir they would not see you in want now that you have delivered to them so valuable a property sir they have treated me very well they are generous liberal-minded men who have done all that they agreed to do my chief concern is that i have protracted my work till most of those i wish to please have sunk into the grave success and miscarriage are now but empty words i dismiss the result with frigid tranquillity having little to fear from censure or to hope from praise but lord chesterfield i am told that he has written a paper to the world in which he praises your work in exilus and declares that he makes a total surrender of all his rights and privileges in the english language for the term of your dictatorship nay more that he believes in you as his pope and holds you to be infallible there is a loud rap upon the door which before dr johnson can reach it is opened from the outside and a young man in the livery of lord chesterfield enters he carries himself with impudence and keeps his hat upon his head i have a letter from lord chesterfield for dr johnson there is an answer dr johnson taking the letter and twirling it in his hands addressing himself slowly to mr boswell if my servant were here i would tell him to inform that young monkey that if he did not remove his hat i should be under the necessity of throwing him down the staircase as it is i shall be obliged to do so without warning instantly the hat comes off and the servant is all politeness beg pardon sir i'm very sorry sir i did not know dr johnson was in the room will you read the letter sir there is an answer sir dr johnson opening the letter reads aloud lord chesterfield presents his compliments to dr johnson and takes this method of informing him that the dedication of the dictionary will not be displeasing to him and that he is ready to show his appreciation in whatever manner will be agreeable to its distinguished author very handsomely said why no sir it is too late i am indifferent as to what he may say and unwilling to confess obligation where no benefit has been received 
i would not have the public believe that i owe to him that which providence has enabled me to do by myself lord chesterfield is a very proud man but you are i think the prouder man of the two mine sir is defensive pride but enough of this to the servant tell your master that there is no answer that i will communicate with him thank you sir he goes dr johnson to levitt where is frank he was here sir not long since he has i think gone on an errand for mrs williams ah the dear lady i hope she wants for nothing i think not sir if i am not mistaken she sent him for some cat's meat for hodge i am sorry for that she should have waited until my return i would have gone for it i much dislike having a servant wait upon an animal hodge is a good cat but is nevertheless a cat enter mrs williams who is blind and a trifle deaf did i hear someone say i was a cat not in my hearing madam we were speaking of the wants of hodge ah yes i sent frank for some cat's meat he should be back by this time when he comes will you give him this penny handing mrs williams a coin i would not have him feel put upon as the saying is by going errands for a cat you do not sir always treat your friends with so much consideration my friends sir know how to protect themselves consideration for one's servants is the hallmark of the gentleman i shall remember this dr johnson have you seen the epigram of mr garrick on your dictionary it is prodigiously clever sir do not use large words for small matters it is i grant you complimentary coming from an old pupil but davy is not much of a poet he is always endeavouring to shine out of his line he should confine himself to the stage where he has few equals and no superiors i think the couplet and johnson well armed like a hero of yore has beat forty french and will beat forty more excellent sir you may think it excellent but that does not make it so a college servant enters but here comes my faithful servant frank i am expecting a visit from a french lady of great distinction should she call to-day admit her with all ceremony we must not let the french outdo us in politeness yes master he bows and retires dr johnson may i have a word with you my wife occasions me much concern i have been arrested for debts of her contracting she spends much of her time in the streets and uh, i hear that she is to be tried at the old bailey for picking pockets unless uh, you will stand for her character i sir you amaze me i have not been without suspicion that you have been cheated in your wife but this is a matter in which your friends can be of little service i would not be a slave to her caprice it might be for the best that she should be sent to the plantations sir sometimes i think it would a man should marry for virtue for wit for beauty or for money i cannot see that you have secured these or any of them by the surrender of your independence i suggest that the law take its course you shall make your home with me mrs williams shall look after your wants and paul carmichael shall so hector you that you will think your lady has returned i have no doubt that she will sir mr levitt leaves the room he married a street-walker who had persuaded him that she was nearly related to a man of fortune she regarded him as a physician in considerable practice the marvels of the alliance make commonplace the occurrences of the arabian nights but sir who is paul carmichael why sir i am not sure that i know she is a poor woman a violent temper that i picked up one night in the street desperately ill and i brought her here on my back in short sir she is a slut but she has no home and i took her in enter frank dr johnson mr allen craves a dozen words with you sir on a subject he says of the greatest importance tell him to come up to mr boswell mr allen is my neighbour and landlord and an excellent man his dinners too are excellent enter mr allen dr johnson excuse my thus interrupting you in your study but my friend dr dodd the unfortunate clergyman has been sentenced to be hanged for forgery 
discovering Mr. Boswell. Pardon me, sir. I did not know you was engaged. Mr. James Boswell, Mr. Allen, and a very good friend of mine. They shake hands. Can I be of any service to your friend? Dr. Dodd to be hanged? A clergyman? This is awful. It's thought, sir, that you could do much. His friends would petition the Lord Chancellor, the King even, for a pardon or a commutation of the sentence. Signatures can be had by thousands. I do not doubt it. People will put their name to anything, chiefly for the satisfaction of showing that they can write. But what is my part? I am expected to prepare the petition, I suppose. If you will be so good. I must first make myself acquainted with the facts. I would not wish to be known as moving in the matter, but will do what I can. There has never been a time when the thought of death was not terrible to me. I, too, have given much thought to the subject of death. Sir, let us not discuss it. It matters not so much how a man dies, but how he lives. I thank you, sir, and will go at once to Dr. Dodd. I have influence with Mr. Ackerman, the keeper at Newgate. I'll bid you good day, sir. Mr. Boswell, you're very obedient. He goes out. Is Dr. Dodd a friend of yours, sir? No, sir. I saw him once, I think. Then why this distress on his account? He is a human being. Is not that enough? He was, I have heard, a very bad man. Sir, he may have been. But the worst man does more good than evil. He is a friend of Allen's, who is a friend of mine, and he is a clergyman you have many friends sir i hope i have sir if a man does not make new acquaintances as he advances through life he will soon find himself alone a man sir should keep his friendships in constant repair enter frank announcing with a flourish the lady from france enter mrs wolfington my dear peg why all this ceremony you cannot sir have been expecting to see me no madam but i had an inkling of a visit from madame de boufflay a french lady of wit and fashion and i had instructed my man to be very polite as i would not seem unappreciative of her call permit me madam to present mr james boswell a young gentleman just come from scotland your very humble servant madam i only arrived yesterday and have not yet had the unspeakable delight of seeing you though your fame has reached us in the north in what part are you now ravishing the town as sir harry wildair sir the town is good enough i join the ranks of your adorers madam and shall not drink wine till i have seen you but madam to what do i owe the honour of this call i am almost ashamed to tell you sir but i heard that the gentleman was with you sir and i thought he might be davy sir we have had a quarrel and he has left me and i am much fear for kitty fisher oh madam he will return or if he does not i silence sir i will not have you make an assignation in my house to mrs wolfington depend upon it madam davy will soon return when he does let me know and i will drop in and have a cup of tea with you strong tea madam of your making ah you have been such a comfort to me i could not i think live without davy gentlemen with a low bow i bid you good day she goes out how delightful she is why yes sir one does not commonly take the town by storm without uncommon charm but i hope garrick has not gone to kitty fisher else i shall have another friend in distress and who may that be why from the number of portraits he has made of her i rather think sir joshua reynolds is taken in that quarter i assure you sir he would soon recover from the blow i remember to have had my heart broken twice within six months by the desertion of a mistress oh how delighted i am to be in london again i thought that my coach would never arrive fleet street i think never had so animated an appearance it has sir but the high tide of human existence is i think at charing cross the passage door opens very quietly and bet flint a woman of the town enters bet i'm surprised to see you i knew you would be sir but i've come to ask a favour of you sir 
I've written my life in verse, and the publishers say it would have a greater sale if you were to write an introduction to it. Why, Beth, no doubt it would, but I can hardly do that. What would the newspapers say? They're always telling lies about us, old fellows. No, my girl, it won't do. Take your verses to some of your admirers. You have enough. Yes, sir, surely, sir, but I want a Dr. Johnson. And I would oblige you if I could, but it is impossible. Run along. With a smile. I was just about to say there's a good girl. He sees her to the door. James Boswell seems to be attracted by her. And pray, sir, who may that be? Beth Flint. I'm glad that you do not know her. She is habitually a drunkard and a woman of the town, occasionally a thief, needless to say a woman of much effrontery, from the country, I think. London draws all kinds to itself. Country girls come to town to conceal their shame, and men of learning to meet their match. They do, sir. People who live in the country are fit for the country. There is, I think, within ten miles from where we are now sitting, more learning than in all the rest of England. I and Scotland, too, sir, put together. Sir, that reminds me of a question I wish to ask. Have you received any assistance from the learned in the compilation of your great dictionary? If I may accept twenty etymologies sent me anonymously by a gentleman whom I afterwards discovered to be the Bishop of Rochester, I laboured alone, not in the soft obscurities of retirement, or under the shelter of academic bowers but amidst inconvenience and distraction in poverty and sickness and in sorrow yet sir you shall have your reward to have grappled single-handed with great libraries surely your name will last as long as the language you have done so much to perpetuate sir i was a poet doomed at last to awake a lexicographer the unhappy writer of a dictionary labours without hope of praise fortunate if he escapes reproach but i am not yet so lost in lexicography as to forget that words are the daughters of earth and that things are the sons of heaven lord chesterfield will be much chagrined if you do not dedicate your work to him sir after making great professions he ignored me it is seven years since i waited in his outward rooms during which time i brought my work to completion without one act of assistance one word of encouragement or one smile of favour the notice which he is now pleased to take of my labours had it been early had it been kind but it has been delayed till i am indifferent and cannot enjoy it till i am solitary and cannot impart it till i am known and do not want it i once thought him a lord among wits but i find he is only a wit among lords the chief glory of a nation is its people and to them i shall dedicate my work would it not be curious sir taking into consideration your dislike of the scotch and your contempt for presbyterians if a century or so from now the oxford university press decided to bring out an edition of your dictionary edited by a scotch presbyterian to be facetious sir it is not necessary to be indecent enter paul carmichael what is it paul dr johnson i cannot well manage the roast for we have no jack do the best you can with a string my dear to boswell i have for some time contemplated buying a jack because i think a jack is some credit to a house she goes out well but you'll have a spit too no sir no that would be superfluous for we should never use it if a jack is seen a spit will be presumed enter frank another lady sir to see you she would not give her name madame de boufflay at last frank could not manage the name ask her to have the kindness to ascend quick sir take this chair be careful it has but three legs my lady from france must have the only sound chair in the room places a sound chair conspicuously enter mrs thrall dr johnson mr boswell you were it appears expecting me not you madam but a french lady of distinction hence these preparations but you are welcome be seated madam cast yourself into the arms of this chair in all confidence they are sound as are also its legs i do not hesitate to accept your invitation but i must get to business before interruption i am come sir to carry you with me to the country to the country madam why should you carry me to the country change of scene and air change of company and change of food you've been caged up here with this menagerie of yours all too long 
Mr. Thrill charged me not to return to Streatham without you. It is most kind of you, madam, but I cannot go. I have undertaken certain duties that I would fain perform. Mr. Boswell, we could take with us. Your most obedient, madam, in your company and in Dr. Johnson's, I could be happy on a desert island. And Streatham is not a desert island. My coach and four awaits us in Fleet Street. In an hour you shall have exchanged the bricks and mortar of London for fresh fields and pastures new. Dr. Johnson, correcting her. Fresh woods and pastures new, madam. It is in licitous but the sentiment does not appeal to me one green field is like another and the same may be said of a woods but surely you do not enjoy the sordid sights and stenches of the town not all the sights of london are sordid many are magnificent and as for its smells blowing hard pooh we have a fine library at streatham i have just received a parcel of new books as to which i want your opinion and mr thrill will i am sure wish to discuss with you the merits of a dish of lampreys he has just received from scotland our strawberries grown under glass are just coming in fancy strawberries and clotted cream so early in the season and in profusion too madam you would shake the resolution of a much stronger man than i am but only a moment ago paul carmichael was here telling me of a roast that we were to have for dinner and mrs williams and de Blain and flavitt they all hate one another i alone can order sufficient tranquillity to enable every member of my menagerie as you call it to eat their dinner in peace it was to be a dinner in honour of the completion of my dictionary you may argue sir but i will not be denied let me reason with mrs williams the only one of your family group susceptible to reason she will admit that now your great book is finished you should allow yourself a little relaxation and consider sir the fewer the mouths the greater the quantity of food to go into them what you do not eat will no doubt be cheerfully consumed by the hungry-looking individual i passed upon the staircase i had thought to have dined at home and there is the possibility of a charming woman from france let no possibility of a charming woman from france keep you from enjoying the actuality of a with a curtsy charming woman from wales and there is a good dinner to be eaten although i lead the life of a kept woman i am not altogether deprived of the confidence of our cook and before i left home this morning i swore not only that i would be home in time for it but that i would fetch with me the great lexicographer preparations are now going forward in imagination i smell a turtle soup and the lampreys are fresh from scotland there is a saddle of lamb fresh peas and sparrow grass and veal pie with raisins in it enough madam enough a feast for lucullus a tender ham and the glass-houses of streatham are famous for their fruits it is too early for walled fruit but the fragrance of the pineapples is delicious and the oranges were superb when i last saw them mr thrill drinks wine and perhaps you can be tempted to keep him company or should you prefer it join me in lemonade my resolution is like snow in the sun it is a dinner to ask a man to some people pretend not to mind what they eat for my part i mind my belly very studiously he who does not will hardly mind anything else mr boswell will excuse me i am sure frank a clean shirt i'm for the country enter frank bowing and smiling yes sir yes sir end of act one act two the drawing-room at streatham a large country house a few miles from london upon the walls are fine portraits of dr johnson henry and mrs thrale fanny burney garrick goldsmith and others from the brush of reynolds windows to the floor open upon a park of great beauty under the trees deer may be seen it is afternoon double doors closed to the left open into a large dining-room double doors to the right open 
reveal a large, comfortably furnished hall. Everything suggests comfort rather than magnificence, although evidences of wealth are not lacking. There is a large table filled with books. Comfortable chairs abound. Tall vases are filled with flowers. Heavy silver candlesticks are conveniently placed. From the ceiling are suspended two large crystal lusters containing innumerable wax candles. Some years have passed since Dr. Johnson first visited the Thrales, with whom he now spends most of his time, although he still maintains lodgings in London. Mrs. Thrale enters, followed by Judson, a footman, to inspect the room, for a formal dinner party will soon be in progress. Judson, see that Dr. Johnson is presentable when he comes down, that he wears his best suit, his shoes with silver buckles, and his new wig. Be particular about the wig, his old ones is so singed from the candles that it must be discarded. Lose it forever somewhere. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Thrill has ordered the wine? What have we? Hock, claret, port and brandy, ma'am. Have vast quantities of tea and lemonade also, for Dr. Johnson? Yes, ma'am. Send Rattle to me. Yes, ma'am. He goes out. Mrs. Thrale, giving a tug at a great bunch of roses, to herself. Who could have supposed that I, the wife of a rich brewer, would be entertaining at dinner the most distinguished company in London? Enter Rattle. You sent for me, ma'am. See if Miss Burney wants anything, and tell her I await her in the drawing-room. Then tell Miss Streetfield where I am. To herself. She shall shed tears for us after dinner. It will amuse Mr. Thrill, who is in low spirits. Yes, ma'am. She goes out. Mrs. Thrill, taking up a book, which she discards as Miss Burney enters. Oh, there you are. I have been awaiting you this hour or more. What a pretty frock. Dr. Johnson will be pleased. He always notices what ladies wear in spite of the fact that he is almost blind. He once said to me, Why are you dressed in that evil-looking gown? Go to your room and change it. Women, like butterflies, should always wear gay colours. Oh, if Dr. Johnson should speak so to me, I would swoon. Ten to one he will not know I am in the room. Wait and see, my dear. Dr. Johnson is eager to make the acquaintance of the author of Evelina. I hope the room may be crowded when he enters, that I may escape unnoticed. Dr. Johnson would be here now if he suspected you were in the room. He is always the first at any function. Footman announces Mr. Murphy, who enters. Your servant, madam. Steps to one side. Footman announces Sir Joshua Reynolds, who enters, carrying an ear-trumpet. Oh, dear Sir Joshua, how good of you! But you come, I am sure, not so much to see us as to see Miss Burney here, the author of Evelina. Sir Joshua, bowing and shaking hands. Is she here, the prodigy? I laid ten guineas that the author was a man about town of my acquaintance. And now it turns out the book, which is the talk of all London, was written by the daughter of my old friend and present neighbour, Dr. Burney. We live in amazing times. Let me present you. Come, my dear Miss Burney, and meet two admirers, Sir Joshua Reynolds, who has known you all of your young life, and Mr. Murphy, who no doubt will soon be teasing you to join him in writing a comedy. He says such wit and such power of observation as you display cannot fail to take the town by storm. He is already revolving in his mind a plot. Oh, madam, oh, sir, do not mention it, I beg of you. My father is greatly shocked that I should have written a novel. Judge of his feelings should he hear that I whose knowledge of the world is chiefly gathered from conversations overheard in our drawing-room, was engaged upon a comedy. Footman announces Mr. and Mrs. Garrick. Mr. Garrick, rather stiltedly, t'was only when off the stage he was acting. Madam, 
you're most obedient so very good of you mr garrick and mrs garrick too so very pleased they shake hands i hope you did not find the journey from town tedious the roads are so dusty at this season i was saying to dr johnson only an hour ago footman announces dr johnson who at once goes up to mr garrick well davy in what are you exhibiting yourself now mr garrick somewhat nettled sir i am playing and i may say with some success richard the <laughs> third the fellow claps a hump on his back and a lump on his leg and cries i am richard the third it won't do davy it won't do i beg to assure you sir it will do very well the house is crowded every night nay sir a crowded house means nothing people will crowd a house to see a dog walking on its hind legs walks away mr thrale who has entered the drawing-room unobserved mr garrick in the words of johnson ben not sam to-night good sir both my poor house and i do equally desire your company not that we think us worthy such a guest but that your worth will dignify our feast you must forgive dr johnson his rudeness which is indeed only a cloak for his regard he will permit no one to abuse you but himself so i have often been told i was once his pupil we came to london together penniless i gave the town what it wanted he what it deserved i have had applause he toil envy want the garret and the jail but sir dr goldsmith has said the last word concerning him there is nothing of the bear about him but its skin i would add its claws also but i am taming him footman announces dr goldsmith ah i am glad to see you we were just speaking of you they shake hands nothing to my disadvantage i hope certainly my apparel is beyond criticism i have just had this suit from my tailor you will agree i think this plum colour is most unusual most becoming it is unusual certainly where did you get it from john philby at the sign of the harrow in water lane i promised to mention it i think it would be much honoured if you call upon him i am quite sure of it but you have the advantage of me in figure your fine form sets off mr philby's clothes to great advantage just what i observed philby i am glad that we agree great minds you take me sir but there is dr johnson i must show myself to him ah goldie i am glad to see you the play still goes well i hear and it deserves to no comedy in many years has so much exhilarated an audience has so well answered the end of comedy that of making an audience merry i am sir much honoured by the dedication sir it does me honour to inform the public that i have lived for many years in intimacy with you i meant not so much to compliment you as myself very handsomely said but here we are bandying words with one another when we should be paying compliments to a young lady who has just begun to browse upon the literary common you have met the daughter of my friend dr burney fanny a shy little dunce we thought her sir she has written an excellent novel of london life and character i never read a better that is praise indeed and curiously enough a day or two ago when i met sir joshua he told me of a novel he had just been reading a novel published anonymously by Lowndes, and which he said so intrigued him that he give ten pounds to know the name of the author we are speaking of the same book evelina but sir how can that be he called on Lowndes and was informed of that the book in question was written by gentlemen at the other end of town as Lowndes had every reason to suppose but i assure you evelina was written by fanny burney my little burney she confessed to it not ten minutes since you must present me i think i do not know the young lady with pleasure sir direct your steps to the sofa at the other end of the room i left her there in the company of mrs garrick they approach miss burney the best dramatist and the best novelist of the age should be acquainted dr goldsmith miss burney the daughter of my old friend oh sir this is the most consequential day of my life to have dr johnson mention me in the same breath with the author of she stoops to conquer i wish that i might rise to the occasion but my legs are all of a flutter 
i do not deserve this honour don't say so my dear the public to whom we authors make appeal has agreed that you are certainly wittier and probably wiser than the generality of your sex rest satisfied with its opinion it seldom errs and a public which includes dr johnson sir joshua and mr burke among the men and mrs montague elizabeth carter and miss moore among the women can hardly be in error why no madam it would seem not but our fanny must be prepared to bear with a little abuse by and by she will not always be surrounded by her friends who love and flatter her i would prepare her if i could to meet the world by what means sir by flattery my praise is a mere twitter compared with yours do you not agree dr goldsmith dr goldsmith who has been looking at himself in a mirror and has heard nothing of the conversation i certainly do madam turning to dr johnson i am glad to see that mr garrick is able to be out again but do you not think sir that he is ageing why no sir you must remember that garrick's face has had more wear and tear than any other man's it is never at rest such an eternal restless fatiguing play of the muscles must certainly wear out a man's face before its real time bernie my dear i think i shall take a seat by your side i must speak to my host he seems for the moment to be at leisure mr thrale i hope i'll see you well sir indifferent well we men of affairs have much to contend with which you literary fellows know nothing of and we literary fellows have little with which to contend with the world but sir i see admiration in your glance this suit from philby john philby at the harrow in water lane mr garrick has just observed that it sets off my figure to great advantage mrs thrale coming up and overhearing the conversation and i'm sure no one has greater taste in dress than mr garrick do i hear my name you do mr garrick i was just observing to mr goldsmith that no one had ever played such a great variety of characters as yourself that you excelled equally in comedy and in tragedy although i have every reason to be satisfied with the success of my comedy i am bitterly disappointed that mr garrick could not see his way clear to the part of tony lumpkin dr johnson joining the party do you remember sir when we were all in labour for a title for the play and how i suggested the mistakes of a knight while you were insisting upon she stoops to conquer yes and for once i neglected to take your advice without living to regret it footman announces general paoli and mr boswell a large fine-looking man of distinguished bearing and mr boswell enter mrs thrale welcomes the first effusively and the latter with some reserve general we are much honoured mr boswell you see your hero with dr goldsmith dr johnson has just been saying that if the selection of his biographer were left to him he would undoubtedly select dr goldsmith that he has put his hand to every form of composition and has equally adorned them all mr boswell somewhat nettled except the biographical madam it is my set purpose to write the life of my revered friend when it appears and i hope that may not be for twenty years it will be found to be the greatest biography that has ever been written have i not the greatest subject i mean not only to give a history of dr johnson's visible progress through the world but a view of his mind so far as it is within my power to do so no doubt you will take his life with all skill but here comes the great man let us not appear to be talking about him good evening dr johnson i hope i see you well after our dissipation of last night i confess my head ached very considerably this morning why sir i am not surprised to hear it i have no objection to a man's drinking wine if he can do it in moderation i cannot drink in moderation therefore i never touch it but sir it was not the wine that made your head ache but the sense that i put into it mr boswell thinking he has him why dr johnson does sense make the head ache yes sir when the head is not used to it general paoli coming up and very respectfully saluting dr johnson dr johnson you are i presume inculcating lessons of sobriety and decorum upon our young friend here 
why sir i am always doing so with what effect you may judge but sir much may be said in favour of drinking in vino veritas you know i do but i would not keep company with a man who lies when he is sober and whom you must make drunk before you can get a word of truth out of him drinking should be practised with great prudence a man who exposes himself when he is intoxicated has not the art of getting drunk dr johnson you would i am sure recommend claret one can drink a deal of claret without inconvenience why no sir it is poor stuff one can be drowned with claret before one feels the effect of it claret is the liquor for boys port for men and brandy for heroes with a bow you general would naturally drink brandy indeed brandy will soonest do for a man what drinking can do for him mr boswell standing between paoli and johnson i feel gentlemen like an isthmus uniting two great continents which means i take it that your narrowness is apparent and your depth concealed but there's garrick i said something a few minutes ago which nettled him i must go and make it up with him walking up to him are you at your villa at hampton a charming place when is your good lady going to ask me to drink a dish of tea with her i am sure that she would be honoured at your mentioning it and i hope when you are next in the vicinity of drury lane you will look in on me in the green room no davy i'll come no more behind your scenes the silk stockings and white bosoms of your actresses excite my amorous propensities footman announces miss hannah moore a slightly deaf old lady mrs thrale comes forward to receive her so very pleased you did not come alone no i came with dear mrs delaney who seeks a few moments repose after the fatigue of the journey which was without incident i hope quite dr johnson talking to mr garrick i found him an insufferable prig miss moore overhearing dr johnson's remark did you say he was a whig no madam i said he was a prig but indeed he is both prig and whig i too am a whig i wonder why you do not make me a tory you love to make people tories dr johnson drawing some copper coins from his pocket for the same reason that the king did not make these pence guineas not the proper metal sir mr garrick walks away in high dungeon dr johnson turns to mr boswell now i have offended him again yet i love him a game of jokes is composed partly of skill partly of chance a man may be beat at times by one who has not a tenth part of his wit davy is the first man in london for sprightly conversation and yet i heard you abuse him you were telling me only the other day of his having refused you an order for the play to the value of three shillings dr johnson with a stern look sir i have known david garrick longer than you have and i know no right you have to talk to me on the subject garrick was very poor when he began life and so when he came to have money he probably was unskilful in giving it away and saved when he should not but i know that he has given away more money than any man in england that i am acquainted with and he has a very pretty talent for poetry do you remember his song in florizel and perdita i'd smile with the simple and feed with the poor nay my dear lady that will never do poor davy smile with the simple what folly is this and who would feed with the poor that can help it no no let me smile with the wise and feed with the rich as i shall shortly be doing life here madam is as near felicity as life may be expected to be but where is little Bernie? we are neglecting her shamefully over on the sofa yonder in the company of sir joshua reynolds she could not possibly be in better he has known her for many years without in the least suspecting she was a genius the little hussy i must sit by her at dinner so you shall but will not her head be turned with all this flattery why no madam the established wits will keep her in her place it would be difficult for her to maintain herself in conversation for observation rather than retort is her fort she will need all her friends when one bursts unheralded on the town the town feels cheated of watching an ascent they approach miss burney 
who was talking to Sir Joshua Reynolds through his ear trumpet. Yes, sir. I sold the manuscript to Mr. Lowndes for twenty guineas, and thought I had done excellently well for myself. Twenty guineas? My dear young lady, the book was worth a hundred. But one has to make a beginning. I sat up all night reading it and had to deny myself to some sitters the next day i shall recommend it to all my friends and make it unfashionable not to have read it dr johnson comes up we were talking of evelina the subject is inexhaustible i am to sit next to miss burney at dinner i shall be very proud we shall have to be very careful, or she may put us into her next book. Her power of observation is so remarkable. Her portraits would be unmistakable. She would not dare burlesque her friends. Miss Moore, joining the party. Oh, I'm sure she would not. Consider, Dr. Johnson, the respect we have for you. It amounts almost to a feeling of awe. Peers obey your nod, and I am told that duchesses hang upon your words, that your company is more sought than that of any man in London. Stop, madam, stop. Consider what your flattery is worth before you choke me to death with it. More kindly. You were permitted to say some things behind a man's back that you would not say to his face. I heard Bishop Percy say at Chesterfield House that you could, by giving a sign, make or break a literary reputation. Madam, I take refuge in incredulity. I am so sorry that I never saw your play, Irene. I have read that it was the finest tragedy of modern times. You have not read that statement in a bound book, madam. It was written by one pot. Madam, if one pot says so, pot lies. Walks away as James Boswell comes up. Mr. Boswell, I understand that you are collecting material to write the life of our revered friend. I trust it may be many years before you do so, but should the time come, you will, I hope, mitigate somewhat the asperities of his disposition. Madam, I shall not cut his claws or make my tiger a cat to please anybody. I may ask Miss Burney here to give me some anecdotes as she sees the great dictionary maker in Deshabille, as it were. I know Dr. Johnson, the lexicographer, the philosopher, and moralist, but you know Johnson, the ladies' man, a side that is hidden from me. <laughs> and if I do, Mr. Boswell, I shall impart my knowledge to my only confidant, my journal. I am not to be balked of my purpose of making a well-rounded portrait, to which end I shall apply to Mrs. Thrale addressing himself to that lady ah madam have you not repeatedly heard dr johnson say that if he had no duties he would spend his life driving briskly in a post chaise with a pretty woman i have never heard dr johnson say any one thing repeatedly he has too fertile a mind for that but i have heard him utter the sentiment you refer to adding but she should be one who could understand me and add something to the pleasure of conversation i have upon occasions visited the green rooms with him and the actresses invariably make much of him mrs abington positively flirted with him and we all know how partial he is to kitty clive certainly i have heard him declare that she was a better romp than ever he saw in nature and he is not without experience when we were on our journey to the hebrides a lovely pretty young woman hearing that he was come from london peeped into the room in which we were sitting to have a glimpse of the great lexicographer some of her friends dared her to place herself upon his knee put her arms around his neck and give him a kiss she took the dare and what do you think the doctor said i hope he corrected the brazen hussy not at all madam he was quite equal to the occasion he said do it again let us see who gets tired first dr goldsmith coming up 
I'm quite at a loss to account for his popularity. I've observed that women frequently prefer his company to that of men of much greater physical and at least equal mental attractions. Men sometimes surrender their minds to his in a most surprising manner. A few moments ago, a gentleman said, Doctor, and I naturally turned towards him. What do you suppose he said? No, tis not you I mean, Dr. Minor, tis Dr. Major there. It's enough to make a man commit suicide. Dr. Johnson overhears the last part of the conversation, then meditatively. Death will overtake us all too soon. No need to summon him. Rousing himself. Sir, let the subject alone. You write well. Be satisfied with that. And do not seek always to shine in conversation. Oh, Dr. Johnson, that reminds me. I've written a fable which I wish to submit to you. A school of little fishes, seeing that birds can fly in the air which covers the land and the water alike, while they would die if they were taken from the water, petition Jupiter to change them into birds. <laughs> Such writing is very easy. Why, sir, it's not as easy as you seem to think. If you were to make little fishes talk, they would talk like whales. Dr. Johnson, blowing like a whale, retires. Footman announces Mr. Piozzi, Mrs. Carter, Miss Streetfield. Enter a distinguished foreign-looking gentleman, who bows very low to Mrs. Thrale, a charming old lady in an elaborate cap, and a very beautiful young woman, whose chief accomplishment appears to have been ability to force real tears to run down her cheeks, much to the delight of Henry Thrale. Buongiorno, signor. With a slight bow. Mrs. Carter, welcome. How sweet you look. Sophie. To Miss Streetfield. Mr. Thrill has been asking for you. Don't fail to humor him if he asks you to weep for him. He seems very ill to me. In a low voice. I shall be glad when this dinner is over. Dr. Johnson, who is that very charming old lady? I should love to paint her. That is my dear friend, Mrs. Elizabeth Carter, the translator of Epictetus, and equally good at making a pudding. A very accomplished woman. Let me present you. Turning to Mrs. Carter. Madam, I am pleased to see you. My friend Sir Joshua Reynolds craves the honor of your acquaintance. They bow. I have told him of your accomplishments, not the least of which is your skill, with a pudding. Mr. Thrale, to Sophie Streetfield. You are looking very well today. Strange that tears which spoil other faces only increase the beauty of yours. She takes his offered arm. Dr. Johnson, have you met Dr. Franklin of Pennsylvania? He is a most distinguished man. Distinguished in Pennsylvania, sir? But what is he in London? I've heard of his endeavor to force his acquaintance upon Mr. Gibbon. Mr. Gibbon is an ugly, disgusting man and poisons our club for me. When did he meet Dr. Franklin? Why, sir, it appears that Mr. Gibbon and Dr. Franklin, as you call him, were spending a night at the same inn on the road to Paris. Franklin, discovering that Gibbon and he were under the same roof, sent the landlord to say that he would be pleased to pass the evening with him, to which Mr. Gibbon very properly replied that while he esteemed him as a man, yet as an enemy to his king and country, he had no wish to make his acquaintance. Very well said but sir you appear not to have heard the sequel dr franklin in a polite note replied that when in the course of mr gibbon's writing of the decline and fall of empires he came to write of the decline and fall of the british empire he would be happy to furnish him with such material as might otherwise escape his attention a fly sir may sting a noble animal yet it yet remains a fly I'm willing to love all mankind except an American. They are a race of convicts and ought to be thankful for anything we do to them, short of hanging. Dr. Johnson, I am going to ask if you will oblige me by looking over the pages of a tragedy I am writing. I have not quite finished it yet. I have so many irons in the fire. Then, madam, I would urge you to put your tragedy in the fire along with your irons. Dr. Johnson... Here is a lady, a very particular friend of mine, anxious to make your acquaintance. Mrs. Delaney, I present my good friend, Dr. Johnson. I am honoured by your notice, madam. 
Your dictionary, sir, has given me so much pleasure, while it changes the subject very often. I confess that it does, madam, have that fault in common with most dictionaries. I observed with pleasure that it has very few naughty words in it. I hope, madam, that you have not been looking for them. Oh, fie, Dr. Johnson, how can you say such a thing? I did, however, observe that you omitted altogether the word ocean. Omit the word ocean, madam, impossible. Stalking across the room to the dictionary, which lies upon a table, finding the word and pointing to it. There is the word, madam, but you would look for it in vain if you spell it O-S-H-U-N. I have compared your work with that of the French Academy, and I am overjoyed to see in how many respects it excels. Why, sir, what would you expect from fellows that eat frogs? Did the making of the definitions give you much trouble? Thought rather than trouble. We all know what light is, but it is not easy to tell what it is. But, sir, how came you to define pastern as the knee of a horse? ignorance madam pure ignorance the fact is a dictionary is like a watch the worst is better than none and the best cannot be expected to go always right mr baurelli the italian tutor in the thrale family coming up unannounced ah baurelli here i am placed on the defensive by a lady who challenges the definitions in my dictionary to frivolous censure sir no other answer is necessary than that supplied by your own very excellent preface the dictionary is a monument of scholarship and i deeply regret that the italian language has nothing comparable with it dr johnson were you disturbed when the town having in mind your definition of pension an allowance made to any one without an equivalent in england it is generally understood to mean pay given to a state hireling for treason to his country criticised you for the acceptance of one disturbed at the criticism of the town certainly not i wish my pension had been twice as large that the public could have made twice as much fuss about it the pension sir was given not for anything i was to do but for what i had already done mr thrale in a loud voice i have an announcement to make few of my guests know that this company is assembled in honour of mrs thrale's birthday we shall drink her health at the table meantime i wish to present her with these flowers handing her a huge bouquet of roses oh sir you embarrass me at my time of life birthdays are more honoured in the breach than in the observance i assure you madam the years have left no trace you might indeed be taken for one of your own daughters you flatter me and you are at the same time busying yourself with the problem how old is she well i confess to with a smile thirty-five pouting nobody sends me verses nowadays yet swift fed stella with them till she was six and forty i remember do dr johnson make a set impromptu with the rhyme on thirty-five not more remember dr johnson walking up and down in deep thought clapping his hands together quite unconsciously attracting the attention of all why madam a request from a lady upon her birthday is in the nature of a command let me see very slowly until he gets fairly started oft in danger yet alive we are come to thirty-five long may better years arrive better years than thirty-five could philosophers contrive life to stop at thirty-five time his hours should never drive o'er the bounds of thirty-five high to soar and deep to die nature gives at thirty-five ladies stock and tend your hive trifle not at thirty-five for how where we boast and strive life declines from thirty-five he that ever hopes to thrive must begin at thirty-five and all who wisely wish to wive 
must look on thrail at thirty-five there is much applause during which can be heard marvellous astonishing oh sir you are a wonderful man nay madam now you see what it is to come to a dictionary maker for verses do you observe that the rhymes run in alphabetical order exactly which only increases my amazement let me shake your hand sir you have given us a wonderful example of your readiness astounding at your age what would you not give sir to be thirty-five once more yourself why sir i should be content to be as foolish almost as you are but we are getting on dr johnson we are getting on we are sir as you say getting on but that is no reason why we should discourage one another you are a philosopher sir i have tried too in my time to be a philosopher but i don't know how cheerfulness is always breaking in signor piozzi has been good enough to yield to my persuasions and will play and sing for us that exquisite aria parlante which is the talk of the town if we may have a moment's quiet conversation ceases signor piozzi takes his place at the pianoforte and for a few moments plays and sings very agreeably when he ceases there is a rush to thank and congratulate him dr johnson only seems unimpressed superbly done to dr johnson that piece is very difficult sir i would that it had been impossible dr johnson we have had good talk you have tossed and gored several persons it is a pleasant company why sir mr thrale gathers about him the best i will not say the highest company in london he is a remarkable man i honour him if his mind marks the hours rather than the minutes it is enough he does not burden himself with details he is a gentleman he is sir a new species of gentleman living as you see in vulgar prosperity his time is i suppose largely spent in making money it is sir and there are indeed few ways in which a man can be more innocently employed than in making money he might devote himself to literature for his amusement sir the happiest life is that of a man of business with some literary pursuits for his amusement enter footman who throws open the doors dinner is on the table good a time comes in a man's life when he is in need of the repairs of the table immediately a procession is formed two by two in tragedy step they entered the dining-room mr thrale with sophie streetfield on his arm mr murphy offers his arm to miss burney who accepts it upon which dr johnson almost knocks over several people in an effort to retrieve miss burney which he at last does much to mr murphy's chagrin mrs thrale puts her arm through mr murphy's and leads him in as the curtain falls the curtain remains down one minute to suggest the lapse of one hour when it is raised the stage is deserted almost immediately the doors to the dining-room are thrown open and a number of the guests rush out in great confusion mr thrale will recover he has had these attacks before that is the trouble he has been repeatedly warned by his physician against overeating i observed that he had become very flushed just before he fell forward is he dead no but the attack is a severe one he must be bled oh sir let no time be lost these attacks come with increasing frequency dr johnson taking control of the situation to a servant send a man at once on horseback to dr brocklesby and tell him a valuable life is at stake meanwhile mr thrale must be got to his bed dr goldsmith will give us the benefit of his skill he has not i hope forgotten the use of a lancet curtain falls as henry thrale is seen quite unconscious in a large chair carried by two servants end of act two act three the morning room at streatham a large bright comfortable apartment with a fireplace in which a wood fire is burning brightly with doors to right and left between the large casement windows which open to the floor are open shelves filled with books 
On the walls are a number of fine mezzotint portraits of the famous authors, statesmen, and actors of the period. There are several large writing tables, with pens, ink, and paper at hand. Easy chairs are conveniently placed on either side of the fireplace and at the windows. The room is suggestive of what might be called scholarly comfort. On the hearth rug a large dog is seen, asleep, otherwise the room is deserted. The time is about noon. More than a year has passed since the last act. Dr. Johnson enters and looks around. Madam, are you here? To himself. I love not to come down to vacuity. Walking toward the fireplace and seeing the dog. Presto, you are, if possible, a lazier dog than I am. Going to the bell pole and giving it a tug. After a moment, a servant appears. Have you seen Mrs. Thrale this morning? Yes, sir. Mrs. Thrale had breakfast some time ago with Miss Burney. They are, I think, walking in the grounds. Shall I go fetch them, sir? Yes, do. No, wait a minute. I shall not send for her. No, bring me my breakfast. Yes, sir. Will you be having some cold chicken and ham, sir? Yes, whatever there is, in some quantity. I am hungry this morning. Will you look at the paper, sir? No. Yes, bring it to me. Servant leaves the room. Dr. Johnson, speaking to himself. One half that one reads in the papers is not true. The other half is not important. Rather irritably. Surely Mrs. Thrale knows that I do not like to eat alone. Enter servant with newspaper and large tray of breakfast sundries, which he places on the table before Dr. Johnson, who at once begins eating. After a few moments he opens paper, and presently begins to read aloud. Subscribers are beginning to wonder whether they will ever receive the long-promised edition of Shakespeare from the hands of Dr. Johnson. If it is not soon delivered in the ordinary way, a caesarean operation may become necessary. What's this? Continuing to read. He, for subscribers, baits his hook and takes your cash but where's the book no matter where wise fear you know forbids the robbing of a foe but what to serve our private ends forbids the cheating of our friends that's churchill the scoundrel this must not be permitted i have unluckily lost the list of my subscribers and spent the money but by labour the damage can be repaired after a pause this attack will have only temporary currency i must set about this work to-morrow to-morrow and to-morrow and to-morrow why is not my lady here to pour out my tea after a pause he who dislikes his own company cannot be certain that it will be enjoyed by others ah here she is enter mrs thrale charmingly dressed in a white frock with black ribbons carrying a great basket of roses in her arms. She proceeds to arrange these in vases around the room. Dear madam, I have been longing for you. I am indeed lonely when you are absent. Good morning, my dear Dr. Johnson. I cannot always be here. I have, as you know, many domestic duties. Is not Fanny about? She should have poured your tea. I have seen no one but the servant, madam, and he is as sleepy as a dormouse. Fanny is probably engaged upon her book, an example I would do well to follow. Have you seen this attack on me in the paper? Handing Mrs. Thrale the paper. Mrs. Thrale, glancing at it. Yes, I saw it. What shall you do about it? Ignore it, madam. I would rather be attacked than unnoticed. An attack upon an author does him a service. A man who says my book is bad is less my enemy than he who lets it die in silence. A man's fame is different from a woman's. It is, madam. A man's fame is a shuttlecock. If it be struck only at one end of the room, it falls to the ground. Instead of being angry at those who write against me, I should smile to think that they are unintentionally keeping me before the public. Enter Rattle. What is it, Rattle? Miss Esther, madam, has a sore throat, madam. She wishes you would come to her. Those children of mine are always catching something. Tell her I shall be with her directly. Yes, madam. Goes out. 
you must sir finish your shakespeare go to the mantelpiece and take some papers therefrom i find your notes all over the house reading notes are often necessary but they are necessary evils let him that is as yet unacquainted with the powers of shakespeare and who desires to feel the highest pleasure that the drama can give read every play from the first scene to the last with utter negligence of all his commentators excellent advice sir but it is a pity that it should be lost upon my mantelpiece it should be in a book sir a bound book and now you must excuse me i must go to queenie goes out dr johnson to himself i shall send for fanny she shall keep me company he sits alone for a moment and then crosses the room to the bell pole enter servant as i came through the hall sir i heard a gentleman asking for you sir i think it is mr boswell sir show him in at once to himself cheerfully it is always pleasant to see jamie mr boswell enters ah bozzy i'm glad to see you i hope i see you well just come from scotland they shake hands cordially yes sir i arrived last evening and put up for the night at the saracen's head you know the place sir yes sir on snow hill and a most excellent inn it is there is no private house in which people can enjoy themselves so well as at a capital inn i sometimes think a tavern chair is the throne of human felicity but sir as i hope to remain in london for some time i desired a more convenient location and have taken lodgings in great queen street off lincoln's inn fields and how are my friends mrs williams levitt and the rest of your household sir we have tolerable concord at home but no love williams hates everybody levitt hates desmoulins and does not love williams desmoulins hates them both paul loves none of them i cannot understand sir how you can surround yourself with such necessitous and undeserving people if i did not assist them no one else would and they must be lost for want and your work sir how have you been employing your time does your shakespeare go forward sir for years i beat the track of the alphabet with sluggish resolution since i've spent so much of my time here in the broad sunshine of life i've lived a life of total idleness and the pride of literature but i must amend my ways and how did you leave your lady not as well as might be she has indeed been threatened with a consumption but it is now mending she has sent you a pot of marmalade of her own making which i shall deliver at your lodgings in bolt court that is kind particularly as she does not love me is it a peace offering i have not forgotten her remark i have seen many a bear led by a man but never before a man led by a bear one does not love to be called a bear why sir my wife thinks doubtless you have too great an influence over her husband which is perhaps not unnatural to a female mind but at heart she reveres you almost as much as i do i wish i could think so it is delightful sir to be in london again why sir you will find no man at all intellectual who does not delight in london when a man is tired of london he is tired of life for there is in london all that life can afford but sir i never knew any one with such a gust for the town as you have the streets sir are so animated i love the life in the taverns the eating yes sir and the drinking and the play they are i hear giving an excellent performance of the beggar's opera at drury lane so i understand but i do not now go much to the play my eyesight is failing and my hearing as you know has long been defective call remembrance to your aid sir you have not forgotten i am sure the charms of lavinia fenton was she not a delightful polly she was indeed sir in spite of the painful and ridiculous lines for on the rope that hangs my dear depends poor polly's life you doubtless best remember the lines sung by macheath how happy could i be with either were t'other 
dear charmer away why yes sir it is i believe an entirely masculine sentiment sir i believe it is but miss fenton i have heard that she became the mistress of the duke of bolton and that he has married her i hope he may be happy sir love and marriage are different states he wanted to gratify his passion the wench wanted a husband and a title both are suited the match was not i should say made in heaven pray sir do you not suppose that there are fifty women in the world with any one of whom a man may be as happy as with any one woman in particular i sir fifty thousand then sir you are not of the opinion of those who imagine that certain men and certain women are made for each other and that they cannot be happy if they miss their counterparts to be sure not sir i believe that marriages would in general be as happy and often more so if they were all made by the lord chancellor upon a due consideration of the characters and circumstances without the parties having any choice in the matter in your judgment dr johnson should a man invariably marry why sir i would advise no man to marry who is not likely to propagate understanding marriage is much more necessary for a man than for a woman for he is much less able to supply himself with domestic comforts it would appear so quite recently sir a friend who had been notoriously unhappy with his wife upon her death immediately married again that sir might be called the triumph of hope over experience dr johnson have you ever considered the possibility of a second marriage why yes sir frequently indeed i may say that i have been thinking of it this very morning you amaze me sir and why sir i was very happy with mrs johnson her birthday our wedding day and the day of her death have been generally kept by me with solemn observation by taking a second wife i pay the highest possible compliment to my first marriage would enable me to enjoy the continuance of domestic comfort to which i have long been accustomed marriage is the best state for man in general and every man is a worse man in proportion as he is unfit for it but sir you are it would seem very comfortably settled here why in some sort i am but since the death of henry thrale there is something lacking in this establishment the household lacks a head as does the business indeed it is mrs thrale's wish that the brewery be disposed of as one of the executors of thrale's will i stood out against it but i know not why i should be concerned there is no male heir to succeed to the business and the estate could be the more easily cared for if it were sold and the proceeds invested in the funds indeed a knot of rich quakers are to call this very morning to discuss the matter in which case i should be going but i would be glad to say a word of greeting to mrs thrale before i take my departure i will send for the lady if you will be good enough to ring boswell goes to the bell pull thank you how did you leave my lord of auchinleck your father you keep on good terms with him i hope passably sir we differ over money matters he recently paid bills for me to the sum of a thousand pounds but i am still in some distress over a number of small debts small debts are like small shot they are rattling on every side and can scarcely be escaped without a wound great debts are like cannon of loud noise but little danger just my experience sir your readiness never ceases to amaze me you instantly put into words thoughts which we ordinary mortals but clumsily revolve in our minds why sir in conversation i admit to a certain verbal facility but mrs thrale will wish me to extend the a hospitality of this house will you have chocolate or join me in a cup of tea thank you sir but i breakfasted not much over an hour ago you will excuse me and my other friends in edinburgh how did you leave them very well sir lord monboddo desired me very particularly to present his compliments to you he still insists that mankind is descended from monkeys <laughs> and is still searching for his own tail i suppose if he wishes to own a monkey for his ancestor i know not why i should dispute his claim enter servant will you say to my lady that mr james boswell has just arrived from scotland and would pay his respects to her if she is disengaged 
Yes, sir. Goes out. I often think, sir, of our tour to the Hebrides. I hope the remembrance of it gives you as much pleasure as it does me. Why, sir, I do not know how much pleasure you derive from the remembrance, but it was the most pleasant frolic I ever had, and I would not for five hundred pounds forego the recollection of it. If you and I live to be old men, we shall take great delight in talking over our experiences. Why should we wait to be old to enjoy that pleasure? Do you remember, sir, our experiences on the vessel going to Mole, and how seasick you were? I do not, indeed, look back upon that particular experience with any great amount of pleasure. And yet, sir, the sailors did not seem to heed the storm. A storm makes a sailor but little more miserable than he is already. No man will be a sailor who has contrivance enough to get himself into a jail, for being in a ship is like being in a jail, with the added chance of being drowned. And what has become of your great brown cloth coat with the side pockets, each of which might almost have held a volume of your dictionary? Why, sir, I brought that safely home with me, and my great oak stick that I carried all the way from London, in which I was going to present to some museum which disappeared so unaccountably. You never heard of it again, I suppose? No, sir, as you said at the time. Consider the value of such a piece of timber in mole. It was not to be expected that the man who found it would part with it. Why, no, sir, being a Scotchman, you are to consider that there is very little soil in Scotland and very few trees. It indeed chiefly consists of stone and water. It does, sir, but you will admit that Scotland has a great many noble, wild prospects. Sir, it has, and so has Norway, and Lapland is remarkable for its prodigious noble wild prospects. But, sir, let me tell you that the noblest prospect which a Scotchman ever sees is the high road that leads him to England. Dr. Johnson, you seem to forget that God made Scotland. I remember, sir, that he made it for Scotchmen. We are a fine, sturdy race, sir. Why, yes, sir, I believe you are. Goldsmith says somewhere that man is the only animal that has reached a natural size in your country. Ah, sir, since we last met we have experienced a great loss. Goldsmith has been taken from us. Do not speak of it, sir. I cannot think of it with tranquillity. Was he buried in the abbey, sir? No, sir, in the temple. He was greatly in debt at the time of his death and it was thought that there might have been a scandal. He was buried at night in ground just north of the temple church. It was very solemn. I have heard that he was careless in money matters. He was, sir, but let not his frailties be remembered. He was a very great man. He left scarcely any style of writing untouched, and touched nothing that he did not adorn. And Garrick, sir, his death is a great loss. I never think of Garrick, but the tears come into my eyes. Garrick's death eclipsed the gaiety of nations and impoverished the public stock of harmless pleasure. Why, sir, I would not hear of the election of his successor in our club until he had been dead a year. I insisted that we undergo a year's widowhood. I knew that he was one of your oldest friends. We came to London together, penniless. That is to say, I had tuppence in my pocket, and he had three halfpence in his i have heard that he died a very rich man sir no actor has ever enjoyed the public esteem so much as garrick his profession made him rich and he made his profession respectable he rests i believe in the abbey yes sir and properly at the foot of shakespeare's monument i shall place a wreath upon his grave a merrier man within the limit of becoming mirth I never spent an hour's talk with all. And I will go with you, and afterwards we will call upon his lady in the Adelphi. Enter Mrs. Thrale. Mr. Boswell, I hope I see you well. They shake hands. Madam, you're most obedient. Shall you stay long with us? I have heard you say that no lover ever longed for his mistress with greater ardor than you for London. Why, madam, that is so. It is my hope to spend several months in town. It has been several years since I was last in London, during which time there have been many and sad changes. Yes, and more are impending. 
since mr thrale's death and the marriage of several of my daughters streatham has become a burden neither education nor inclination fits me for the management of a great business of all things i loathe the brewery with its mysterious adulterations well madam we hope soon to relieve you of that burden then i think i shall retire to brighthelmstone for a season surely madam you would not think of giving up streatham think of the many happy years you have spent here surrounded by such comforts and elegancies as are within the reach of few my life here may not have been as happy as you think mr thrale my late lord and master was not invariably kind i married not so much to please myself as to please my family it may be that you will again think of marriage dr johnson and i have just been speaking of second marriages and are agreed that they need no defence there is i think nothing more beautiful than a marriage of inclination on both sides enter servant mr barclay and mr perkins are in the drawing-room mr boswell rising to go madam i kiss your hand dr johnson i hope to meet you at the club on wednesday i bid you good morning goes out mrs thrale to servant mr boswell's hat and coat ask the gentleman to join us here madam i have heard your plans with great displeasure think well before you leave streatham with which you have for so long been identified enter mr barclay and mr perkins mrs thrale your servant dr johnson yours we have come in the matter of the brewery mr perkins and i have caused a very careful inventory of the property to be made which in essentials agrees with the one you yourself gave us we have had a number of conferences with our friends in the city and in all the circumstances feel justified in offering you the princely sum of one hundred and twenty five thousand pounds for the property i would decline it madam we are not here to sell a parcel of boilers and vats but the potentiality of growing rich beyond the dreams of avarice i am sir of the opinion that we should hold out for one hundred and fifty with care the property can be enormously developed mr thrale by his i regret to say folly several times placed it in jeopardy a saving of only sixpence in a barrel would mean a capital sum at the end of the year and such economies can i am sure be readily effected you forget madam that i am entirely familiar with the business and know better than you can possibly do its value to a penny no it is because you know the value of the business that i ask for one hundred and fifty thousand i would not have my daughters say that i am unmindful of their interest one hundred and twenty-five madam let the subject go over until after we have eaten a good dinner lubricates business shall we stroll through the grounds the brewery has enabled us to live in some state here for many years let me show you the glass houses they go out and the curtain falls to suggest the passing of a few hours when it rises again miss burney is seen reading in a great chair after a moment she puts down the book miss burney to herself excitement is running high in this house and no wonder it is not every day that negotiations for the sale of a great business are carried on right under one's very nose i smell malt and hops now enter miss thrale oh my dear fanny have you seen mamma or dr johnson i wonder where they are what can be detaining them transactions of magnitude are not concluded in a minute i saw from my window a gentleman arrive on horseback do you know who he was not his name he was here for a moment but was not presented after he had gone i asked dr johnson who he was and he said that while he was loath to speak ill of a man behind his back he believed he was an attorney mr barclay sent for him some time ago the party were walking in the shrubbery and mamma left them and came to me and said one way or the other the affair will soon be concluded if all goes well she will wave to me a white pocket handkerchief she goes to a long window opens it and looks out i see no one yes behind that tree dr johnson and mamma where are the others can they have gone oh fanny come look mamma 
She sees me. She waves her handkerchief. Oh, the brewery is sold. Now we are no longer in trade, and I am an heiress. She goes out at the window, leaving Fanny alone. Presently the footman comes in with a large tea tray, which he places on the table, as Dr. Johnson, with several papers in his hand, and Mrs. Thrale enter. Mrs. Thrale pours tea. Madam, I congratulate you upon the happy termination of this affair. It only remains for you to add your signature to this agreement. You will sign just above my name. Mrs. Thrale signs. How wonderful it all is. Stops pouring tea. I think I shall go in search of Queenie. Leaves. If an angel from heaven had told me thirty years ago that a man I knew by the name of Dictionary Johnson would one day become partner with me in a great trade, and that we should jointly or separately sign notes, drafts, etc., for three or four thousand pounds of a morning, and finally dispose of the business for one hundred and fifty thousand pounds, how unlikely it would have seemed ever to happen! Unlikely is not the word, madam. It would have seemed incredible. Neither of us was then being worth a groat, and both as far removed from commerce as birth, literature, and inclination could get us. I have been accused of being only Mr. Thrill's sleeping partner. What nonsense! However, it is all over now. My three days a week at the counting-house are a thing of the past. Farewell to the brew-house and to the borough. Adieu to trade and tradesmen. I have purchased restoration to my original rank in life. I shall retire to Bath and repose my purse. Retire to Bath, madam. Repose your purse. What nonsense is this? Your purse will be equal to the demands made upon it. We live here in comfort, if not in luxury. What more could any woman want? She might want a husband. A husband? God forgive you, madam, if I have heard aright. Sometime since, I determined to tell you when I could. Why should I not marry? My children are of age and are independent, as indeed I also am. I love and am loved. If I have concealed the fact from you, it was only to save both of us needless suffering. Speak kindly to me. You make me feel that I am acting without a parent's consent. A parent, I dared to hope, madam, that your feeling for me was such... Stop, sir. Dr. Johnson, for many years I have devoted myself to your service, have been at your beck and call. Your comfort was my first, almost my only consideration. But the time has come for me to think of myself. I married once to please my family. I shall shortly marry to please myself. And one other you stun me madam may i inquire certainly all the world must soon know it signor piozzi piozzi madam a foreigner and a fiddler impossible why sir it was you who first taught me to respect mr piozzi i remember well when i met him at an evening party at dr burney's he was asked to play i misbehaved and you reproved me saying why madam because you have no ear for music do you destroy the performance of a gifted musician i may have taught you to respect him but that is no reason why you should love him indeed i think you cannot be so lost to shame as to abandon yourself your children your religion and your country for an italian music-master wherein is the shame he loves me and i love him know you a better basis for marriage than love love madam you bewilder me are you so lost in self-respect as to throw yourself into the arms of an adventurer i who have loved you esteemed you reverenced you i who for years have thought of you as the first of womankind entreat you to consider before you disgrace yourself sir how dare you in what way would i disgrace myself by marrying signor piozzi his birth is not meaner than that of my first husband his sentiments are not meaner his profession is not meaner and his superiority in that profession is acknowledged by all the world is it want of fortune then which is ignominious the character of the man i have chosen has no other claim to such an epithet his religion the religion to which he is an adherent will i hope 
teach him to forgive insults he has not deserved mine i hope will enable me to bear yours with dignity and patience the suggestion that i have forfeited my fame is the greatest insult i have yet received my fame is as unsullied as snow or i should think it unworthy of him who must henceforth protect it enter miss thrale and miss burney i hear high words what is the cause queenie your mother has just declared her passion for piazzi for piazzi good god turning to dr johnson can you not restrain her i fear indeed that she has lost all sense of shame oh mrs thrale let me entreat you i thought i detected her partiality for the music master but hesitated to speak we are not the best of friends if madam the last act is yet to do this is too much i must ask you sir to leave this house and at once i shall at once obey you madam i cannot remain under the roof of one who would indulge herself in such an amour can it be that she is my mother mrs thrale in tears how can you speak to me so i have done nothing to deserve this my child turns against me fanny do you speak to me one word of comfort not i madam i blush to be present at such a scene turning to miss thrale my dear i think we owe it to our characters to leave this house they go out oh madam forgive me i spoke in haste and in passion whatever you have done however i may lament it i pray god for your forgiveness i pray that he may grant you every blessing that you may be happy now and hereafter and i ask you to forgive me i am ready to do what i can to contribute to your happiness in return for that kindness which has soothed twenty years of a life radically wretched that is spoken like my old friend only the fear of your disapprobation has given me anxious moments it would be a great grief to me to quit england had we unkind feelings toward each other quit england oh my dear lady prevail upon mr piazzi to remain here you may live here with more dignity than in italy and with greater security your rank will be higher and your fortune more under your own eye do not let mr piazzi or anybody else put me quite out of your head god's blessing be upon you madam you have always been very dear to me mrs thrale bows low and goes out dr johnson throws himself in a chair overcome with emotion presently he says i shall lose myself in london in london a man is always near his borough raises his hands in prayer to thy fatherly protection o lord i commend all the members of this dear family end of act three act four a large room in an old house in bolt court just off fleet street a door to the right opens into a small passage door to the left into a bedroom two windows look upon the court the dark red curtains are drawn there are several bookcases filled with old books in some confusion. There is also a large table not far from one of the windows, on which are two lighted candles, for it is night. A large armchair stands close to the table. An old sofa is in one corner. There are a few unimportant prints on the walls. A fire burns fitfully in a small grate. The time is December 13, 1784. The weather is damp and cold. The room is deserted. Presently, Dr. Johnson, in a long dark dressing gown, looking very ill, enters, leaning on the arm of his colored servant Frank, followed by Mrs. de Moulins. They help him to the large chair, propping him up with pillows. Are you feeling any easier, sir? I fear my days of ease are over, but I should not complain. He that would live to be old has God to thank for the infirmities of age. I may possibly live, at least breathe, three days, perhaps three weeks, but I find myself gradually growing weaker. Can I do anything for you, sir? The Reverend Mr. Houle promised to come and read the Bible to me. Should he come this evening, as I hope he may, admit him promptly? Yes, sir. I hear steps in the passage goes to the door, opens it. 
Mr. Hool enters. My dear friend, I came to redeem my promise. How are you this evening? Do not ask, sir. I am very ill. What is the weather? It has, I think, no effect upon the human frame, but it may powerfully affect one's spirits. It is a cold, raw night. I thought so. It is good of you to come to me. Not at all. I came to read to you. What shall I read? The prayers for the sick? No, sir, no. I can pray for myself. Read one of the Psalms, the twenty-third. Mr. Hool, taking a Bible from the table, opens it, and begins to read in a low voice. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Louder, my dear sir, louder, I entreat you, or you read in vain. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I have often wondered, when I came to die, whether I would wish a friend with me, or have it out with God alone. After a pause. I have been peevish, sir. You must forgive me. When you are as old and sick as I am, perhaps you may be peevish, too. Do not mention it, I beg of you. You are, it seems, a little better. I think I am. I would give one of these legs for a year more of life, I mean, of comfortable life, not such as that I now suffer. A young lady, Mary Wollstonecraft, enters quietly and addresses Mrs. de Mullins. Miss Wollstonecraft, to sit with you, sir. She comes forward. Dr. Johnson greets her. You have not forgotten me, I see. It is good of you to come. Come sit by me. She sits. I am glad to come. How are you, sir? Very ill indeed, even with you by my side. Think how ill I should be were you at a distance. I wish I had something to bring you, but I am very poor. A silver teapot is all I own in the world. I have nothing. Don't say so, my dear. You have my heart. I hope you don't call that nothing. Are you still concerning yourself with the wrongs of women? Yes, sir, and shall continue to do so, so long as the law discriminates against us. Dr. Johnson, with a flash of his old controversial self returning. My dear, nature has given women so much power that the law very wisely gives them very little. But, sir, laws were made by men and imposed upon women. Is that fair? The law is the last result of human wisdom, acting upon human experience for the benefit of mankind. I must not become involved in this discussion. I am going, sir, and shall meet Dr. Gibbons. Have you any message for him? Tell Dr. Gibbons I should be glad to see him. If you'll call on me and dawdle over a cup of tea, I shall take it kind. They shake hands. Mr. Hool goes out, accompanied by Frank. I cannot debate with you, sir. I love you, sir, and wish I could revere your opinions as I do you. I used to debate mightily for the sport of it, but it fatigues me now. I am a sick old man. I should not have troubled you, sir, with my opinions. I shall not when I come again. May I come again? Whenever you will, my dear, I am entirely dependent upon my friends. She takes his hand, kisses it, and goes out, leaving him alone with Mrs. de Moulins. Would you like a book, sir? No. Yes, a book should help us to enjoy life or endure it. Bring me a small book, a book that can be held readily in the hand, is the most useful, after all. Mrs. de Moulins, going to the table and fetching several small volumes. There is a knock on the door. Mrs. de Moulins goes to the door and opens it. Sir Joshua Reynolds enters, goes up to Dr. Johnson, and greets him tenderly. My dear friend, you have, I think, a better colour than when I last saw you. We shall soon have you about again. You are, sir, one of the kindest friends I ever had. If I wished to speak evil of you, I would not know how to set about it. Did you pass a comfortable night? 
no sir i was sleepless and in pain i thought for a time that my mind was affected to test myself i composed latin verses they were poor verses and i knew that they were poor this comforted me for i knew that i had not lost my critical faculties i have just had a letter from our friend dr taylor dr johnson his mind wandering a little dr taylor dr taylor of ashbourne sir your old friend and mine for whom you have in the past written so many sermons he wrote to say that he was greatly pleased with the portrait the portrait why yes don't you remember your portrait that i painted for him you are leaning slightly forward and there is a red curtain at the back you thought it made you look too old ah i remember i know the room in which it is to hang the room with the crystal lustres dr taylor was pleased was he yes he said it was an excellent likeness the chief excellence of a portrait is the resemblance i think if you will assist me to the table i will write a letter he is assisted to the table where for a few moments he writes pausing now and then for a word when the letter is finished he hands it to sir joshua will you be good enough to read it my mind is not i fear entirely clear sir joshua taking the letter and reading it slowly my dear madam among the earthly felicities by which heaven has ameliorated the lot of mortals none is more likely to enhance personal rectitude or promote domestic bliss than the congenial intercourse of friend and friend i have recently madam passed several weeks in your home cheered by all that prosperity could supply of comfort and all that friendship may afford of affection you will not fail to comprehend that i am deeply sensible of your benefaction suffer not your family to forget dearest of ladies your most humble and obedient servant sam johnson an excellent letter sir i am sure the recipient will greatly value it i must try once more again writes and then very slowly reads the letter aloud mr johnson who came home last night sends his respects to dear dr burney and all the dear burneys little and great to mrs de moulins when frank returns will you ask him to deliver the letter to dr burney sir joshua will be good enough to post the other certainly an odd thought strikes me we shall receive no letters in the grave where shall i be buried think you doubtless in the poet's corner in westminster abbey i hope sir i may be thought worthy of that honour i am sure of it sir the door opens and mrs siddons enters in the manner of a tragedy queen i was told i might enter i hope i did not disturb dr johnson trying to rise why no madam i am glad to be disturbed looking around and observing that no chair is ready for her you madam who so often occasion a want of seats to other people will the more easily excuse the want of one yourself i am greatly honoured by this attention i have but a moment sir i am playing queen catherine to-night but drury lane is not far and i could not resist the impulse of paying my respects to one i so greatly esteem it is a fine part and i wish that i could once more hobble to the theatre myself catherine is a noble part sometimes when i play less noble parts i think of your lines the drama's loss the drama's patrons give and we who live to please must please to live it is good of you madam to remember them i am penetre with your kindness my time is up may i come again i am alas always at home madam she shakes his hand bows and goes out 
Enter Frank with Dr. Brocklesby, an old friend, who greets the doctor tenderly. Sir, as I came through the Strand, I met that rake, Jack Wilkes. He inquired very kindly after you, and desired me to give you his best respects. That is good of Jack. How many years ago it is that I first met him at Mr. Dilly's table. He bore an evil reputation in those days. And still does, I fear. I hope he does not deserve it. As I grow older, I think better of mankind, and am prepared to call a man a good man on easier terms than heretofore. Not that I would call Jack a good man, but he is a man of parts. He keeps the ball of conversation rolling swiftly. Freedom from pain and conversation is all I require to make me happy. I have come to do what I can. Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? Pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow, raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart. Therein the patient must minister to himself. But if he cannot, sir, to die is dreadful. To go we know not where to lie in cold obstruction and to rot this sensible warm motion to become a kneaded clod knock on the door which is opened by mrs de Moulins, who is in constant attendance enter mr wyndham and miss burney they greet dr johnson very quietly in turn fanny dear burney you were in my mind when a short time ago i wrote a note to your father i have just heard of your return from oxford the journey was i hope a pleasant one yes but i was glad to get home this is not looking around streatham but my friends are about me all except one do not mention her name sir i blush and weep for my sex when i think of her have you heard from her no sir i would not permit her to write to me however much she desired to do so she is, I hear, with Signor Piozzi in Milan. I hope she may be happy. I owe her a debt of gratitude for unnumbered acts of kindness and of love. I am glad to hear you speaking kindly of her, sir, for wit, genius, generosity, and superlative powers of entertainment I have not met her equal. Nor have I, sir. But she was licentious why no fanny do not say so that she should prefer the company of signor piazzi to that of a very sick old man is but natural as it is perhaps but natural that the sick old man should have resented it does it not affect you unfavourably sir having so many of us in your room i will withdraw no sir i am glad to have my friends about me i have always desired to escape from myself i wish jamie boswell were here Sudden attack of coughing seizes the doctor, who has returned to the large chair. Oh, sir, you cannot conceive with what acceleration I advance towards death. Dr. Brocklesby, who comes up to him. I fear it is so. I will be conquered. I will not capitulate. Permit me to arrange your pillow. I think I may be able to make you easier. Arrange his pillow. That will do all that a pillow can do turning towards Dr. Brocklesby. Tell me plainly, sir, is it possible for me to recover? Dr. Brocklesby, bowing his head. I fear it is not possible. Then, sir, I will take no more physic, not even opiates. I have prayed to God that I might render up my soul to him, unclouded. Mr. Burke is coming up the stair. Dear Burke, one of the finest minds in England, he and the Lord Chancellor, they tax all my powers. It is good of him to come. Enter Mr. Edmund Burke. Mr. Burke to Mr. Wyndham, who greets him quietly at the door. How is he? This is the end, I think. He is failing fast. Mr. Burke, giving his hand to Dr. Johnson. I've been detained at the house. I hope you're not uncomfortable. My pains have left me, but I'm very weak. Dear Mund, the end cannot be far but I have no fear. Why should you, sir? Your conscience is clear. You have by precept and by example taught us how to live. 
and we may from you learn how to leave this world with Christian resignation. Do some act of kindness every day. His mind wanders. Put a stone on dear Teddy's grave, a deep, massy stone. Mrs. de Mullins, going up to him. I think I detect a change in his breathing. Dr. Brocklesby, taking Dr. Johnson's hand. His mind comes and goes fitfully. For God's sake, sir, can nothing be done? I'd go to the end of the earth to save him. It is evident that Dr. Johnson is quite unconscious of what is going on around him. As Mr. Burke passes the table, he inadvertently sweeps to the floor a sheet of paper which Mr. Wyndham picks up. What is this? A prayer to his maker? Reading. Almighty and merciful Father, to thee be thanks and praise for all thy mercies, for the awakening of my mind, and the opportunity now granted of commemorating the death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Redeemer. Enable me, O Lord, to repent truly of my sins. Enable me by thy Holy Spirit to lead hereafter a better life. Teach me to form good resolutions and bring them to effect. And when thou shalt finally call me to another state, receive me to everlasting happiness for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Very reverently. Amen. 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 Proud and unyielding to those above him in rank, kindly and considerate to those beneath him in station, humble and prostrate before his God. O oh, Samuel Johnson, what a man thou art. I should be going. We should remain, I think. He runs a race with death. Dr. Johnson coming to himself. The race is almost run. I'm afraid, sir, such a number of us may be oppressive to you. No, sir, it is not so, and I must be in a wretched state indeed, when your company would not be a delight to me. My dear sir, you have always been too good to me. My friends, remember me in your prayers and forgive my acts of rudeness. Teddy, dear girl. His mind wanders. He is thinking of his wife on whose grave a stone has just been laid. What a man he was in his prime! What a towering intellect he had. Take him for all in all, I shall not look upon his like again. Nor any of us. You, sir, have made the doctor immortal with your brush. I wonder if Boswell will carry out his intention and write his life. No doubt of it. He has been collecting material for twenty years, and will do it very well. He will write as though he were under oath. Johnson's wisdom and his wit must be embalmed for posterity. His talk must be made a matter of record. Ah, sir, with all his wisdom and learning, he had more comical humour and love of nonsense than anybody I ever saw. And no man could turn a compliment more neatly than he. While he was a scholar, he was also a man of the world. I once heard him say, I live in the world, and I take in some degree the colour of the world as it moves along. The passage door opens, and a young girl enters. Oh, gentlemen, I must see him. I never met him, but he is so good. He sent word to me that he would see me if he were dying. Only for a moment, sir. Only for a moment. You may be too late. Dr. Johnson, rousing himself. I'm glad you've come. Come close to me. She kneels beside his chair and takes his hand. There is complete silence. You said I might come to you if you were dying. I'm dying. Raising his hands over her head. God bless you, my dear. He dies. He is beyond the aid of man. Sir Joshua, in tears. My dear, dear friend, his death will make a chasm which nothing can fill. Boswell should give his biography an epic character. What life save his would bear such critical inspection? None. It is well with a man when he comes to die, to have nothing heavier upon his conscience than having been a little rough in conversation. Curtain End of Act 4 End of Dr. Johnson, A Play 
by A. Edward Newton.